And um, and program produces witnesses with the dates have not been set as acquiring them will be coming October 3rd. We will have regional and freelance journalists to talk about working a wider uh, journalistic beat on October 23rd. We will have Dennis Johnson, who's a publisher at Melville House, who and Melville House is one of the publishing companies that put the Mueller report out and were able to turn the Mueller report around from the release document to a book on our shelves in three weeks, which is pretty amazing. They've done that with other books as well, um, the Senate Torture Report, the Climate Change Report. So while they publish a wide range of books, this is the, one of the things that they are specifically interested in doing. And Dennis Johnson will be here on the 23rd. On December 5th, we have the program is called When Reporting is Personal. And we'll be bringing in writers and poets who are writing about the issues of today in their work now. Um, the other two programs, which haven't been set yet but will happen, are a PEN America Media Literacy Workshop, which is to, um, to help us sift bad news from good news, fake news from uh, real news, and to teach us to be better media consumers because we have responsibility in that too. Anyone who's ever had a friend uh, repost some ridiculous article uh, on social media knows that we bear part of the responsibility for how these things uh, move into our culture. Greensboro Bound was also instrumental in putting this program together. Greensboro Bound does a uh, three-day book festival every year, and you need to make sure you pay attention as that comes up May 14th through the 17th. In addition, PEN America will be um, staging a banned book event next week, Tuesday the 22nd, 23rd, I'm sorry. 24th, she says, at 7 p.m. A higher series about journalism and reporting is the, is the very real fact that journalism is threatened in the U.S. at the moment, um, on all corners and from all directions, economically, culturally, and politically. And so that's one of the underlying uh, ideas behind the whole series. And one of the things we want to consider, at least at some point in the series, is what happens to our culture and to public discourse when there are no reporters, when there is no local reporting, when there are no national reporters, or when you can't tell uh, who is reporting and who is just making stuff up. What happens when there's 
no one to expose uh, a Jeffrey Epstein because law enforcement didn't do that. Julia K. Brown at the Miami Herald did that over years and years and years. And what happens when we have no legitimate local news sources? What happens to our communities then? What happens to our, our discourse? What happens when journalists fear for their careers or even their jobs uh, or their lives for doing their job? This year, for the first time in history, the US made the list as, as one of the top, top five most dangerous countries for journalists in the world. Um, so we want to look at what makes journalism important, what makes reporting important, how it's done, and how we can help strengthen that ecosystem. I will stop talking now. I'm going to introduce Mike Gaspany. And I didn't write anything as an introduction about Mike Gaspany, partly because I assume everyone knows Mike, and they probably don't. But uh, Mike taught journalism. He was a reporter for years. He taught journalism for a long time. He's now uh, transitioned into a poet, which is probably a wonderful job for journalists to transition into, I imagine. Everyone should take note. Uh, and, um, and he knows more about this than I would ever hope to. So please welcome Mike Gaspany. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, this is, of course, the opener for the Writers as Witnesses series. We're gathered here to discuss why local journalism matters. We're going to have a panel discussion, then a QA. and uh, If you don't know anything about PEN America, which is possible, it's a wonderful organization. It was founded in 1922. Its headquarters are in New York. It's a nonprofit that exists to defend and celebrate free expression in the United States and worldwide through the advancement of literature and human rights. Um, I'm going to introduce this uh, distinguished group of panelists. I used to practice the profession they are gracing right now. Um, all are investigative reporters. Um, to my immediate right, is Bethany Chapin. She is Chapin. She is a producer and reporter for WFDD in Winston Salem, and she was a prime mover in a wonderful collaborative series called On the Margins, which explored housing issues for citizens out of the money in the triad. As part of that report, the voices in Bethany's coverage of redlining in Old Asheboro, which is just eight blocks in that direction, the voices just leap out of this report. It's a wonderful thing to hear. Um, uh, to her right is, <clears throat> is Jeffrey Billman. Uh, Jeffrey is the executive director for Indie Weekly, located in Raleigh-Durham. I wrote a few pieces for that august publication long ago and got the ax. Um, <laughs> Uh, Jeffrey uh, uh, has specialized recently in many different things, uh, especially controversies over Confederate statues and the rise of white nationalism in North Carolina. His paper has been described by the Columbia Journalism Review as possessing a spine of steel. How do you like that? Okay, and then we have Phoebe Zerwick. spent 19 years in prison before he was finally exonerated. Uh, and then we have Jordan Green, uh, the Ed City. Uh, a lot of wonderful pieces, uh, fascinating pieces about uh, some of the scams that have been run recently in this area by various drug treatment centers. Uh, also, he's an expert on what's going on in neighborhoods in Winston-Salem, High Point, in Greensboro. So all are welcome. Thank you very much for being here. And I thought I'd just start by reading a quick paragraph that might focus us or center us a little bit. 
And it goes this way. With fewer eyes on the powerful, democracy is threatened. What we don't know will harm us. It numbs the public conscience, producing good times for greed and prejudice. The wealth gap increases. Citizens on the margin become the forgotten. At one time, protection of most Americans believed that the press and radio and TV offered protection on behalf of the public good. That has come under severe challenge in recent years. Uh, and in a way, all reporters all, almost stand like a boxer fighting a gigantic octopus of criticism from various quarters these days. So the first question I'd like to ask the panel is, let's talk about those tentacles which you all are dealing with and how that octopus has affected your work, the kind of opposition you guys are probably facing now. Anybody want to start with that one? What are your basic challenges? <laughs> um, get the mic, George. Oh, okay. <clears throat> I was trying to think of what the challenges are. Uh, I, I mean, they are today what they always have been. They are reporters trying to figure out uh, who is telling the truth and how to get information from people who, officials that don't want to give them information. Um, so, I, I mean, elected officials and governments can sometimes be a little more arrogant now because there is kind of a, um, there is a vogue of dissing the press, um, but also, there's fewer reporters and more stories. Um, so in a way, it's kind of a golden age of reporting. There's more, more great stories at your fingertips. There Jeff is, um, sorry. I don't mean to pick on any media outlets because we're all kind of in the same boat. But the um, News and Observer, which is the daily in, in Raleigh, um, I think about 10 years ago, eight years ago, something like that, had a newsroom staff um, of, God, I don't know, 120, 140 people, just, just reporters. Um, and I think after the last round of buyouts, they're down to about 30 or 40, um, depending on, on, on uh, how you count and who you include. And a lot of that is um, uh, they're sort of aggregation people. They're getting a lot of young folks in to do um, you know, turn out uh, uh, three or four stories a day, and um, not to, I mean, a lot of them are, are still, a lot of them are great, a lot of them are really good uh, uh, journalists, a lot of good writers, um, but I think what's missing, um, a friend of mine who, uh, or an acquaintance of mine, rather, who used to work there, a woman named Mandy Lott, um, was, was telling me this. Uh, the biggest issue is not that, you know, the basic goings on of a city council meeting, especially in a major city like Raleigh, are being covered. It's that that's all that's being covered, right? Like, it's not, it used to have people who would be, you know, uh, pulling code, re code enforcement records of, uh, you know, slumlords or, and, 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 and sort of digging into, um, you know, just a lot of the stuff that goes on um, inside City Hall. And, and that's the thing, those are the things that aren't really getting done to the degree they were 10, 15 years ago. And, and that's where, I mean, that's where a lot of the bullshit happens, right? Like, and, and, and people just don't, uh, we don't know what we don't know. And, and, and I think there's a lot more that we don't know. And, and, and the biggest obstacles for me, um, you know, uh, as an editor, I, I run a newsroom. Um, I know five times as many things that I want to go investigate as I could possibly assign somebody to go do at any given moment. I have stories um, that I could, if I, had a, if I had a bigger budget, I could have stories for you know, 15 different journalists that I, that I can't pay. And that bothers me, because there are things that aren't going to you know, get reported, and there's nothing I can do about it. And that's uh, exceedingly frustrating. Phoebe. Yeah, um, so I'm not in a local newsroom anymore. I left the newsroom 10 years ago, but as an observer and champion of local news, um, 
I think what both of you are talking about to some extent is the economic pressures. And so we think about um, the assault that journalists are under um, politically. We have a president who calls us the enemy of the people. But I think the more insidious, maybe not more insidious, but an equally insidious problem is this economic problem, which is um, that there's just not enough money there's not enough advertising money anymore in journalism because of Craigslist and all the way, all of us shop now online, you know, we, we don't look at ads anymore, or print ads. So there's not enough money to support big, robust newsrooms anymore. And, um, and we're all suffering from it. Um, there's so many stories that go uncovered. Um, I was just talking two days ago with Barry Yellen, who writes for you, and he's just done this big piece that, um, that he got all this non-profit funding for on the, the hot oh, yeah, yeah. And so 10 years ago, I am confident that those stories would have been told by environmental reporters at the NO, uh, the Independent, yeah. the Charlotte Observer, the Winston-Salem Journal. When I started at the Winston-Salem Journal, we had two full-time environmental reporters. Mm -hmm. I, for a while, was a health reporter. I was one of two or three health reporters. Um, as far as I know, there's no um, environmental reporters full-time left in North Carolina, are there? There, there are in, um, like, uh, I think, Policy Watch. Yes, uh, but, it, 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 um, yes but, not in, a, but not uh, in mainstream sort of daily. I don't know that. Um, I don't know that at a. I don't. Does the NO have anybody who's on like any sort of? I don't think so. Yeah, and I don't think there's any full-time health reporter. So health is, you know, the issue of our lifetime. Um, Medicare for all. All of this. There's all of these important issues are yeah. just not getting covered. Um, so that to me is this sort of unrecognized problem. And also, none of us want to pay for what we read anymore. <laughs> I'm guilty of it. I'm sure you're all guilty of it. You want you want your you want your journalism for free, and so we end up with newsrooms that can't afford to do the stories that they want to do. Bethany, is the same kind of shrinkage going on in, in at WFDD too? Actually, no. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, that's hard to say because I I wish everybody was in our boat, and I can't say that we knew we'd be in this boat. I, I think it's due to a lot of things. We have great leadership right now. We have a strong team um, that's you know, putting in 150% every day. Um, but you know, I think it's because of the challenges that we're facing culturally that um, our defenders are coming out in full force. And um, they're supporting us um, to an incredible degree. And because of that, we are able to, to continue looking forward and in ways we can grow. Um, we still definitely have a lot of challenges. We're still a small newsroom. Um, we wish we had the resources and the time and the people to go in depth all the time. Um, and that project that you mentioned on the margins, um, I could only do that because a lot of my colleagues sacrificed some of the things they were working on in order to support me during that time so that I could stay focused. So, um, but I will say that because of the challenges, we are really full of and um, you know, we hope to expand. Now, you know, sometimes that's dependent on, you know, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and our funding and things like that, and that can always change and be in flux. Um, but right now, we feel pretty steady. But, you know, a few years ago, we didn't know what we were, could expect out of the next, you know, four years. So, um, but luckily, we're, we're feeling okay right now. Great. That's good. We're glad to hear some good news. Jordan, were you going to say something? Oh, okay. Well, um, I have a, go ahead, I have Phoebe. A piece of good news on the local journalism mm -hmm. front, um, which is that, and I was looking for the citation today and I couldn't find it, but I know I read this study last year that showed that even though the public distrusts the media with a capital M, the public really trusts their local newscasters mm -hmm. and local mm -hmm. um, newspaper. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true of local. Mm -hmm. So that there's something about this local journalism thing that could be a, a, a 
of healing for um, this distress that so many people feel for the media at large? I, I have, I'm sorry, I, I, I've, I really have no concern whatsoever for, for people who, uh, for the people who don't want to uh, believe us or, or you know, that whole thing. I, it doesn't, it's, um, it's not a thing I, I spend any amount of time caring about. Um, our, I mean, our readers are, um, our readers know us, uh, our, our, our audience is growing. Our, um, you know, on all the, all the metrics that, you know, readership-wise, you're, 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 you know, people are paying attention, people are engaging with us, um, you know, and, and uh, uh, so, yeah, we have, we, we, we have trust, we have rapport with our audience. Um, when, we, when we put out something, um, you know, we know that it resonates and we know that it matters. Um, and, you know, on, on that point, I mean, one of the, one of the things about, uh, that I've spent a lot of time on in the last year or so, um, is trying to sort of reinvent the model of what we do and, and, and the business model of what we do and, and shifting it away from an advertising, uh, or starting to shift it away anyway from an advertising-based model um, and, and, and essentially just going out and saying, hey, look, um, you know, you guys like us, you guys trust us. Um, if you want us to keep doing it, uh, give us money. And um, which sounds, uh, that took me a little while to get over the, the kind of ego trip of that, um, but it worked, um, you know, look at the account in a while, but I think in the first, or people are, people are into what you're doing. You know, I think believe in um, the community, you know, what you're trying to accomplish for, for, for your community, for your people. So, um, and, you know, I think that's. Well, they're really good signs. Say America in one of its surveys said that 45% of the stories written about a community or presented about a community still come through the newspaper. Mm -hmm. So people are still trusting local news in some ways, maybe not in opinion on the opinion page, but in terms of the information that's presented. Uh, Jordan, do you get this, this kind of reaction too for Triad City Beat? Um, yeah, we have uh, our ardent support. Um, and I do want to say about WFDD is uh, your station's really stepped up, I think, um, since our industry is kind of cratered in, and uh, so the station has really kind of stepped in to, to fill a void, and I think um, Alt Weekly is the same way as uh, daily newspapers have had trouble. Um, Alt Weekly have had a chance to kind of step, step up and shoulder some more responsibility. Um, I, I do, uh, I did want to, I, I am worried about the, the discourse and in engagement. I know all of our outlets have had results and we all have very passionate supporters, but um, from our publication, Triad City Beat, um, I, we get a lot more trolls than we did a couple of years ago. And the function of the trolls is uh, basically to shut down the conversation. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, I, I'm struggling to think of examples, but they just um, deride and degrade people and, and kind of sh change the topic. Mm -hmm. um, yes. And so I really have worries that I don't think the media is today what it was in the past mm -hmm. in terms of being a common place for people to yes. come yes. and share a set of facts <laughs> maybe argue over those facts. I mean, yes. there is a pretty significant segment of people who have opted out of yes. those facts and yes. are creating an alternative ecosystem yes. of misinformation. And I, don't, I don't know what to do about that. Yes, yes it's terrible. Uh, we are dealing with scenarios and not facts. And the consensus that could once be reached by American supporters of media, based on the facts in the media, that consensus is, has almost disappeared. Uh, and it's terrifying. I wanted to uh, ask Bethany uh, to talk a little bit about her On the Margins series. Uh, Jordan mentioned how WFDD has stepped in, in a way, which is great. Uh, and what she did she produced this series, and also she reported in the series. And what she focused on was uh, 
Martin Luther King Drive and the, and the neighborhood called Old Ashboro, which is located very close to where we are now. And she was contrasting Old Ashboro and conditions there, economic conditions there, with a newly gentrified area called Southside, uh, which is adjacent. Yeah, so I can give you a little bit of background on that series, and I will say that, you know, of those sitting up here, I'm definitely the newest investigative reporter up here. Um, I started more in arts, um, and then was working more on the editorial side of things, um, sort of finishing the pieces before they went out, and so this project gave me so many new opportunities to dig in in, in ways that um, were very new to me and exciting and wonderful, um, and the series couldn't have happened without amazing collaborators. Um, you heard Mandy Locke mention, she spearheaded this, she was our fearless leader. Um, she came in and basically was like, I am going to, to be your guide and, and teach you how to. Um, yeah. Yes. Oh, that. Yeah. Uh, so what we wanted to do was really um, incorporate data more into our reporting uh, because that was something that because we were you know, lower on resources, we hadn't really had the time to do, but we also hadn't had the training to do it either. And so we were looking at eviction rates. We were also looking at um, some data from Reveal, Center for Investigative uh, Reporting. And um, you know, this area had some of the highest eviction rates in the country and also um, was presenting as an area for modern day redlining, so mortgage discrimination and things like that. Um, some holdovers from redlining in the 30s. And if you're not familiar with redlining, um, there were these maps that were drawn to basically kind of guide the banks and their lending practices. Um, they, were, they were drawn on racial lines. Um, and so pretty much you know, these, these areas that really needed the infusion of, um, of money to grow and to, to better themselves never got it and um, didn't get any of this attention. So I, we expected, but you know, a lot of these areas around the country, areas that were redlined in the 30s, um, have become areas now where you're witnessing gentrification um, across the board. So we expected by, by tracing these maps in Greensboro that that was what we would find in the Lashboro, and instead we sort of found this neighborhood that was, um, you know, still, I don't want to say stuck, but sort of living between all these other forces that, that it was, um, you know, it had been a part of, and um, it had a really rich history, and so we didn't find what we thought we would find, and so the story really became about, you know, uncovering layers of a place um, and we did that by talking to the people who lived there and, and analyzing the forces around it. And so it's really, that's why it's sort of on the edge. It's sort of, you know, this gentrification, this growth, this development could extend into the neighborhood and that is what some people want. You know, people who live there, who own their houses, they want, you know, those values to rise. They want good things for their neighborhood. Um, but also there's not enough affordable housing in this community. And so, um, as the neighborhood kind of had been in decline, the city in the 70s decided we're going to declare it blighted, we're going to try to make sure that it doesn't continue to deteriorate. And so they started up buying up, you know, houses and stuff. But if you go there, you still see they're all boarded up, you know, nothing, nothing's really changed and it's, it's decades later. And um, so that was the focus of my piece. My colleagues worked on eviction stories, mainly in Winston, found that the housing authority there um, was almost the top of the list for evictions in Winston-Salem, which was really surprising to us. Um, so they dug into court records. I was looking at, um, you know, mortgage data and, and U.S. Census data and things like that and some interactive mapping. So, yeah. The voices in the piece about Old Ashboro are pretty remarkable. And one of the residents says, after praising the glories of home ownership. He had lived in this neighborhood for a long, long time and talked about how it had changed. He said, if you own your own house, everything else in the world is possible. All else is possible. You can stand up and accomplish pretty much what you want to, but if you don't own that house, you are under other people's jurisdiction. 
Uh, yeah, I, the heart of that piece is a man named Jody Martin, and um, you know, talk about new experiences for me. You know, this story was about door knocking and just um, asking people to share with me, and he uh, was fantastic and wonderful. And um, he had inherited his home from his parents. His parents had bought um, their home, I think, in the the fifties or early sixties. And um, he was really uh, just illustrated how a home is one of the fastest ways for a family to build equity and to pass that equity along and build some generational wealth um, that, that is incredibly beneficial. And so I, I couldn't have said it better than Jody. Um, he, he's a retired A&T professor and um, a lovely human being. Jordan, you've been uh, investigating some similar matters in Winston-Salem, haven't you? Gentrification in, is it in East Winston? Oh, yes, okay. Um, sorry, it took me over. Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, there is uh, a, an area that's historically African American and underinvested um, adjacent to the Wake Forest Innovation Quarter. Um, and really, as long as I've been watching Winston Salem, there's been a concerned about gentrification, um, and now um, it, it seems kind of imminent because there are um, wealthy, highly educated people working in the innovation quarter that um, are gonna run out of housing and they're probably gonna wanna jump across um, Highway 52. Um, so what I think is interesting is uh, everybody professes to be concerned about gentrification. Um, and there are a number of um, master plans and, and discussions about revitalizing the East End area. But there's really no plan to um, make sure that the housing that's built that in the East End remains affordable. And in fact, there's like a whole, when you're driving through, you can see a whole collection of buildings that are boarded up. So the people have already uh, moved out. And I think I was told that those apartments, some of them rented for as little as $300. Mm -hmm. So um, I couldn't find anybody who could say where those people have gone. Mm -hmm. um, so the good news is the area is picking up um, in terms of new businesses opening and investment. It's, it looks nice. Um, but the, the question for our cities around here is where are poor people going yes. to live? Because um, the supply of housing is not enough, people don't earn enough to cover rent, and so yes. that's, that's our struggle. Yes, it's a basically where have all the people gone kind of situation. The same thing's happened in Greensboro. Uh, there was a building called the Dixie Building, which was the oldest residential building in downtown. Uh, it was torn down to build a new hotel across from the ballpark. It was a place where a lot of people who absolutely had nowhere else to go lived, and to my way of thinking, it was horrible to see. Um, so we move on. All of these issues are linked, by the way, and we'll see this by the time this discussion is over. I thought it might be interesting now to move on to the white nationalism, the rise in white nationalism that we've seen in North Carolina and, of course, around the nation. Uh, and what I'd like to do is to, let's see, I want to start with a quote from Jeffrey. Uh, Jeffrey wrote, the Republican Party's embrace of white racial grievance and cultivation of authoritarianism in its pursuit of power, have eroded liberal democracy's guardrails. Um, and I've got a whole bunch of questions about this, the first of which is, have we really seen an increase in white nationalism, or have we basically seen white nationalists who once were in the closet emerging? Go ahead. Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Um, actually, uh, Jordan probably knows more about this than he I. Does. He's yeah. sort of the state's resident <laughs> expert on uh, weirdo far right people. I think it's kind of your kind of your thing, man. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I mean I don't mean that in like a weird way. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of your 
Sure. Yeah. Well, I'm not, I, I will just say um, that, uh, yes, we all thought like there was this uh, sudden rise in white nationalism after Donald Trump was elected, and then we were like, oh yeah, the Dylan Roof massacre in 2015, there was all kinds of uh, white uh, supremacist backlash to Obama. We just thought it was anomalous, and now we see it as uh, characteristics of, um, I, I don't I sense that it's on the rise in North Carolina and in the country, but it's hard, you can use different metrics and it's, it's hard to say. I mean, it seems to me, I, I, would, I would sense that, yeah, absolutely it is. And, and, and it's not just, I mean, in numbers to a degree, yeah, but also in a feeling of empowerment, right? Mm -hmm. And it's also a feeling of, um, you know, when you have people in power who are sympathetic to your, your, to your view that was once marginalized and, 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 and perceived as being sort of reactionary or radical, and now you, you have um, you know, people who are giving aid and comfort to it, that it, 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 it's a little easier to come out of the shadows, right? And, and that sort of feeds on itself. And, um, and you know, social media also feeds on, uh, feeds radicalization. It, it just does. I mean, it, it did in, um, you know, it's, it's done it all over the world. It's doing it here. It's doing it in uh, um, Europe, too, with, with the rise of far-right populist parties. It's not uh, a trend that's inherent here. But it's also, um, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a political science literature that goes back uh, on this for, for decades, and I don't, I really don't want to bore everybody with this, but uh, but essentially what happened is, and uh, the, the, the piece I think you're quoting, if I'm not mistaken, I was writing uh, a little bit, I'd, I'd been reading a book about uh, essentially how, how democracies fail. It was a book by a couple of Harvard professors. And part of it is that, um, what has happened in America, what has happened in, in Western societies generally, is that politics uh, has become linked to culture, right? Like uh, ideology has become a cultural identity. And when that happens, y you lose the ability to, um, you, you, you kind of get locked into your own thing and you can't sort of, you can't negotiate, you can't, uh, um, the, other, the other side is becomes, People who oppose you become illegitimate, and when that happens, you end up, um, uh, you know, it, it becomes a war, right? And um, the what what happened in the U.S. and what has actually happened in um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm gonna I'm gonna go on, I'm gonna bore you, but basically what happened is the Republicans got there first because they have a, a natural inclination toward authoritarianism. There are several books written about that. I can explain later, but that will bore all of you. So. Anyway, that's the context of that piece. But yes, the answer is yes. Okay. Yeah, they're crazy. Yeah, well, all right. Well, uh, you also wrote um, that the far right is fueled by the methamphetamine of Fox News, talk radio, and other right-wing media. Yes. Uh, uh, Phoebe, would you like to comment on this? Yeah, I was just going to jump in and bring it back to local journalism. Okay, all right. <laughs> um, okay. And I'm not in any way an expert on this topic of white nationalism at all. But when we lose um, local, and I'm going to say mainstream newspapers, and I know I'm surrounded by alternative <laughs> press and WFDD, which I love, um, but when we lose this kind of common ground of agreed upon fact and uh, kind of shared culture, um, which is what um, I believe daily newspapers provide in the community, I think it becomes easier for extremism to get a footing because people become alien to sure. other people. And, um, you know, this is a huge topic, but we, we live in, the media has become so fragmented. So I'm old enough to have grown up with, um, you know, Walter Cronkite coming on the evening news every night. We, there was a, agreed upon set of facts mm -hmm. and the shared culture and we don't have that so mm -hmm. much anymore. Yes. And it becomes, actually it becomes very local in one way. Uh, Jordan wrote a story about uh, an attempted Klan march in, in Hillsborough, if I'm not mistaken. We're in a city where the Greensboro massacre occurred uh, in 1979, was it? I'm having trouble with my years. 79. Um, and in Winston, we've had plenty of controversies 
uh, about the Confederate statue as we have throughout throughout North Carolina. So it is true that it is a it is a broad category, uh, but it also has a very strong local application, I think. Uh, and it's it's interesting too to think about what is it, I'll ask you all this, what is it that makes uh, people who look like me want to cling so much to who they are? I'd say most white nationalists probably, uh, well, they're younger white nationalists, but most of the backing that they're getting are from people who look like me. <laughs> There's a... Um... This goes back about 60 years. There's a, there's a paper, and the guy's name is uh, escaping me. He's a political scientist who wrote a thing about uh, status anxiety. And essentially, the, uh, the premise behind this, and it's held up fairly well over the years, yes. is that when you have a, um, a, a hierarchical status in, in a society, when you, are, when you have a, a privileged position, uh, white male, you know, cis, straight, whatever, um, and you start to lose your position of privilege. And it's that old, as the saying about, um, you know, uh, what's the saying about oppression? Like whatever, yeah. It's been a lot. Yeah, that's, that, like that's the one I'm thinking of. Um, it's, it's like that. You start to, you, you start to, you feel like you are being oppressed because other people are, are, are you're no longer, you're starting to lose your status. And that's what, and so you lash out. And that's, um, I mean, it's just a, a, a try and true principle of sociology, right? Like that's, that's the reaction to it, is, it, is you, you think that you are entitled to, to, to the status that you were born into and that you have and that was passed down to you and that you, um, I worked hard for my money that was given to me uh, when I was born. And, um, you know, and, and so, uh, and so you, you, you know, it's sort of baked into us, right? And um, I mean, that's a short version of it, so sure. I'll stop talking. About okay, well, Richard Hofstadler is the, is the guy you're yes. referring to. He's the guy who came up with the term status yes. anxiety. And it was one of those books, I think it came out in the 1950s, and essentially what it said was there's a conformist attitude that sets in that is associated with certain social classes, and they want to keep their rights and privileges at all costs. You would hope that that would have been modified to a certain extent because that's like 70 years ago, but it seems as if it's been reactivated recently. Yeah. Yeah. That's, a, that's an evolutionary thing, though. Well, maybe so. Uh, Jordan, do you want to speak? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, I really don't have the an answer. I mean, what's why are white people so crazy is the question. I, think. <laughs> and I, uh, I don't know. I, I um, it, it, when I was in my twenties and the nineties, I worked in construction in Lexington, Kentucky, um, and um, it was very racially segmented. Um, the framing crew was white. The masons, uh, the bricklayers were black. The roofers were, were Mexican, and um, my uh, fellow white workers were just uh, infused with rage, racism, um, homophobia, and misogyny. And um, so I have like, questioned um, how could you get white people to see themselves as part of a multiracial um, coalition to, uh, you know, a populist coalition to um, secure uh, benefits and rights for everybody and come to some kind of sane future. And most days I figure it's, energy is probably better put um, organizing people who are already kind of on board with others shared humanity, so yes. I'm kind of pessimistic about, yes. about that. Yes. Uh, anybody else have a, uh, a possible solution, or can anybody suggest any relief for the psychic condition that Jordan has just described? How about anybody in the audience? A demographic shift? Speak about it. I mean, that's what it's going to take is white folks are going to have to become a minority. You don't have to have a demographic shift where they lose power. That's pessimistic as I can get. It'll be worse.
worse than the short term, though. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> just saying. Yes. Anybody else want to talk about that? Uh, you want a little piece of sunlight. Yeah, let's hear it. I look at my kids in mm -hmm. school and the, and the students that they go to school with. It is really incredibly diverse, um, all different backgrounds, um, a lot of interracial marriage over the last like 20 years, and maybe another generation or two will look a little more like each other. And, um, and some of this apprehension will change, but time takes time. I think, it, it, I think you can yeah, see this. Right. As, you, as you drive around town, almost any town, you can see that children are doing a lot better with these issues than adults are. No doubt about it. Um, I'm, I'm kind of curious of, about writers as witnesses and what you all have seen and how you've reacted to it. Um, uh, Phoebe, in particular, uh, wrote a, a, a highly acclaimed series of stories about Daryl Hunt, and I'd like for her to talk about those stories in a minute, but the one, one thing that really strikes me about that is that oftentimes we become so involved in a story or we, it's easy to become spellbound or to become under the R of sources or people we go, 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 go close to. And uh, sometimes it just slightly distorts our view of things. And, uh, you have a, a, a really terrific quote um, about the aftermath of Daryl Hunt, which I want to get you to talk about. Uh, and you said this, I regretted that I had accepted his calm demeanor. I was beginning to suspect that he concealed a more troubled life. So please talk about that. So, um, I don't even really know where to begin. Um, so I'm going to go through the early part just very quickly to bring you up to date. Um, but Daryl Hunt was a man who was wrongly convicted in Winston-Salem back in the 80s. Um, in the early 2000s, I was assigned to write, uh, to take a fresh look at his case, and I wrote an investigative series that help lead to his exoneration. And um, I would say this idea of you know, being a witness and keeping your distance, this is something I think that most journalists I know struggle with. So how do you keep your detachment, but how do you write with heart and compassion? How do you get to know people so that you can write about them in a way that, read, that will resonate with readers, but still keep detachment. So I was really, when I first got into this case in 2003, I was really committed to this idea of detachment. Really, really committed to it. Um, and um, I don't know that I thought we were sort of moving away from this idea of objectivity mm -hmm. to the idea of, 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 of going for the truth through facts, but um, I worked really hard not to get s sucked into the aura of this man who really did have an aura. I mean, people who got to know him um, were really moved and touched by him. Um, but I thought that that would diminish um, my work. And I think it probably would have. Um, so then jump ahead um, 10 years or so, he, he was exonerated and became a real champion for civil rights and court reform, and um, he also was in, in a small, not, it's not small, but he also worked one-on-one -on -one with a lot of inmates coming out of prison, and so he was, you know, he was a real public figure. A lot of the reforms we had in North Carolina in our court system can be traced back to the advocacy work that Daryl Hunt did and in part to this quality that he had. So he had um, this real 
commanding presence, a quiet kind of commanding presence. And um, then things began to fall apart for him in around 2014. I was not a journalist writing about him anymore. In fact, um, I worked with his lawyer at Wake Forest, and sometimes he'd come to my classes, and I would just kind of hear through the grapevine that he was struggling, and I think that's what that gets at. Um, but well, he had lots of other close friends, so I wasn't going to step in as, as his close friend. But I was, you know, I was. I, I don't know where I was with that, but I. As a journalist, I was super committed to this idea of detachment. So then he died. Um, by all accounts, he took his own life. And I was drawn into do, writing about him again and kind of re-exploring what this, partly what this idea of detachment was all about and also all the parts of his story that I had missed um, over the years. Um, so. I don't know what I have to say about bearing witness, except for the fact that you can't really do your job if you get too engaged, but you can't do your job if you're unengaged. And it's a really fine line that I imagine everybody here has, has walked. Bethany, go ahead. Yeah, I think um, the saving grace is your editor. Yes. And um, so a, a wonderful editor lets you come in and um, just do sort of an information dump and also an emotional dump and just say, like, here's where I'm at. I, and, and even if you don't say, I'm under the spell of the story I just heard, they can see it. And um, they can sort of, um, you know, they might let you live there for a little while um, and, and figure things out on your own. But they're ultimately, if, if you're still um, a little lost, they will help you find your way out. And um, you know, normally you have one editor, and so that trust that you build with them is just very solid. Um, for this last story I did, I actually had two, and at times that was incredibly challenging because we all saw the story differently, and we could have written it um, in different ways, and it would have turned out beautifully, and it ended up being a true hybrid. Um, which, but but in the mix, that was very challenging. But I will say, for uh, I think editors end up being far more than just um, you know, people who edit you on the page. They, they are your emotional support system. And I think that's what gets you through it. And your colleagues, but mainly your editor, who knows the most intimate details about a story and how it's affecting you. Yeah, I mean, I, I think anybody who does a, and spends a significant amount of time in a story, and I, and I spend most of my time editing. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's kind of my, uh, my role in, that, in, I guess. Jordan probably knows this. Like I, I, I can be fairly brutal when I when I edit things, um, but just because I, you know my job is to be detached and to be heartless and to not care what you think, and uh, you know because that's I I I'm not invested in your feelings at all. I just I want the story to be good and I want to be right, um, and but it kind of works. So last year I was working on the story and and um, it was the first time I'd actually reported a story uh, for several months, like for a significant story. And I, I, got, I just got wrapped into this weird story about sex abuse at the school um, that I just kind of stumbled into. And, and it kept getting weirder and weirder. And I went down this rabbit hole with it. And I ended up writing this thing. And I was like, you know, and I saw the editor of my paper, and I had nobody to edit it. So I, I, called, up, I called a friend of mine. And I was like, um, who was an, he used to be my editor like 15 years ago. And I was like, Hey man, you mind giving this thing a read? And I was like, uh, this is like this 10,000 word draft at this point, a sprawling thing, Atlantic piece kind of deal. And I sent it to him, and he emails me back like a week later. He's like, this is shit. And I was like, Thanks, Bob. He's like, cut it in half. And I, like, and I read it again. I'm like, yeah, you're right. All right. So I cut it in half, and uh, um, you know, it was better. So I mean, yeah, I, I think I think you're right. I mean, I think it's. Um, a lot of it is in, uh, um, you know, the thing that I try and tell writers, when they're, especially when they're working on big projects, is at some point in your process, you got to step back and say, all right, stop caring. Yeah, like, and, you, you care, you get it on the page, stop caring. And uh, that's great advice, and I, I swear, the older I get, the more I believe, cut, cut, cut. And so now, we'll cut from the panel to the audience. Um, I would love to hear questions from you all. 
I'm sure you're here to, to ask questions and to comment, so fire away. Diana. Um, I don't have to go oh, good, okay. Please. What's your name? Lori. Lori. jump in on that um, because this was in a sense what had, what had happened um, 20, 30 years ago with the Hunt case. So it's sort of the same situation. So over all these years, um, the newspaper tried to be balanced and so would give both sides equal weight. But it turned out that only one side had the truth, right? <laughs> and so I think that um, what you see happening seeing happening today is that news organizations are not abandoning balance and that they're abandoning a principle, but um, searching for the truth instead of going for a false balance. I mean, it, it comes up with, you know, reporting on climate change. So 10 years ago, everybody would say, oh, some scientists say this and some scientists say that. Well, no, one scientist is against doesn't believe in climate change and everybody else does. It was the same thing that um, when I started at the Winston-Salem Journal, we were still saying smoking, according to some scientists, mm -hmm. smoking causes cancer. Yeah. I mean, so um, I, I don't think that news organizations are, are abandoning principles. I think they're just coming to terms with how to get it, what's, what's true. Sir, go ahead. What is y'all's opinion um, as folks that are doing reporting in the communities on um, the whole concept of um, certain activists, um, especially around white nationalism, um, taking the big platform kind of view of trying to limit um, folks, white nationalists, access to um, um, getting the message out, even if that means Um, well, I think that deplatforming is effective. It's an effective way to stop uh, white nationalists from recruiting um, and intimidating their uh, uh, their adversaries. Um, it is an uncomfortable uh, place for uh, it, that is an uncomfortable thing for a journalist to say because it does um, on its face saying that uh, seems like. It, it, it goes and goes against the principles of free speech. Um, and it's interesting to report on uh, clashes between, um, here it's uh, neo-Confederates and anti-racists. Um, I have been, you know, in a, I guess I, I, I sympathize to an extent with the deplatforming because I've seen um, enough virulent racists who, um, kind of hide their um, extremism and their violence when they talk to reporters, um, I hate to say it, generally television reporters who are parachuting in on the story and they um, just uh, get kind of platformed without any kind of critical questioning. Um, but I, you know, I do try to interview um, extremists and white nationalists to get information on who people are and where they're coming from and I myself have been deplatformed with anti-racists coming up and <laughs> yelling at me and asking me why I'm trying to talk to this person. And um, so maybe it's better to just message people on Facebook before <laughs> I get <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, so I can go on and on. Sure, too. please. So just a reminder, I mean, free speech means that the government shall not interfere with our right to speech. It doesn't mean that 
as a journalist or a publisher or mm -hmm. a book writer that you have to publish what everybody has to say. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not actually familiar with the phrase deplatforming, but <laughs> as journalists, we're not obligated to print whatever anybody wants to tell us. We're obligated to pursue a story and print, use judgment or with our editors use judgment and print what we think gets at the story. Yes, sir. Um, question is of regional reporters and working with local papers and others. What's the, I'd like to say, what's on the other side of the page when you're looking at the local opinion page? Mm -hmm. How do you, how, how is that constructed or is it, how, how is it developed? Because if one day you pick up the paper and there's an opinion on one side of an issue, the next day it seems like it, the, the people are reacting to the people who were on it the day before. Is, how do you vet that? So it depends on the depends on the paper. Um, so mine's a little different because we're uh, smaller. Um, so like a, a, a daily, a, a typical like daily operation is going to have a, a editorial board. It's going to have a um, like an editorial page editor who's in charge of the editorial <coughs> operation. The NNO, um the News and Observer, the McClatchy papers have a joint thing now. Um, Joe, correct me if I'm wrong. If you know this, I don't. They have a joint operation. They combine the editorial thing statewide. That's correct. That is certainly the case in Green Farm and Salem. Yeah. So I, I believe that my friends from the Flash Papers said the same thing. Yeah. Uh, so I think they combine the operations now. Um, so anyway, they have. Um, uh, so they have an editorial page editor. They have. I don't even know how many people are on the editorial page, uh, editorial board now, but they have, however many writers. And um, so they, you know, reach consensus and they'll have somebody uh, write it and that'll be the voice of the paper. So they also have a series of op-ed people and, and dailies, uh, going back to the both sides things, um, always feel the need to um, let people, uh, uh, you know, represent all manner of opinions, no matter how banal or whatever. Um, they even let people like J. Peter Zane write for reasons that... <sighs> Fathom, oh good God. Um, but they let people write who should not have a pen. But um, so, you know, they, they do that in the interest of balance. And um, uh, so that's why you have this sort of, you know, kind of back and forth thing. They'll, they'll have these sort of op-eds that go, but the, the voice of the paper can be, depending on the publication, it usually more or less, can, it's more or less consistent, I, I think, on, on most issues. Um, most editorial boards tend to be, um, you know, I mean, most, most these days tend to be fairly centrist because they're, they're afraid of pissing anybody off. They really are. It's, it's sad. And that's why nobody cares. But yeah. Next question. That is correct, and, and I'm the one who put together the series. So we are, we are trying to, um, as we build the other two panels, um, as we have to kind of look at the series as a whole. And if I had known you were there, um, in fact, your colleague you know, suggested that I talk to you tonight, which I was going to do. Um, so we sort of. It's a, it's a mix of being able to get the people on the right day that we need them um, and putting together a panel that, um, that works with the issues that we want to work with. But it is something that we, that we think about when we put panels together, both for Skepernal and for Greensboro Down. And sometimes it works out better and sometimes it doesn't work out as well, but it is a thing 
that we seriously consider. I will say that, um, and, and I'll give, my, uh, give away my age. I started doing this in 1987, and people have been saying that since 1987, that we tried and we couldn't. Thank and you. Yeah. I'm tired of that. Tried and also, one of the things that is being recommended in various circles of people who consider themselves allies is that when you are invited to be on a panel, ask if there are women, people of color, and other marginalized people on the group on the panel. If they're not, make space for those people or recommend. But we have here uh, a situation that there are three different organizations involved in putting this together, and it's white. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm here. Like I'm, I'm on one of the other panels. And I, I can say that I think that uh, that's a that's a problem that that goes deep into newsrooms too. I mean, I, I work for a I work for a, a newsroom that is a project of a social justice nonprofit. We hired our first black reporter ever this year. Um, and when I worked at the News and Record for a decade, that was that was probably the most diverse newsroom that I ever worked in. It was really 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 white, um, and um, it's just a, you know, and, and it's frustrating too because I've spoken to like journalism classes where like young black reporters um, feel discouraged and, and they, or they get into newsrooms for, mm -hmm. you know, a year or two and they're discouraged by what they're asked to cover, what they're waved off of. It's, Yeah, I mean that's a that's a. I mean we have um, we've hired. Uh, I mean I hired uh, Thomas I this year, and, and that was uh, I think the first. I mean I've been there for I've been in the Indy for four years. I think that was the first, and we hired our, our photographer who was black, um, and those were the first two black staffers we've had, in on the editorial side. And they told me I don't even know. It's it was a long time, and 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 that's and. You know, that was something we went out of our way to, to, to do. I mean, in part because Durham is a 40% uh, African-American city. Um, but I think it's also, uh, you know, it, it, it's endemic in, in an industry. If you go to most journalism conferences, um, uh, you know, they're gonna be, they're gonna be, you know, 95% white. And, and, and that's, um, I've been to a lot of them and they are. And uh, um, you know that's a uh, um, a reality. I think a lot of us who are in this business are are, are you know trying to deal with. Um, there is, I mean, the one thing I would say about that, um, I know the Ida B. Wells Society has moved into UNC Chapel Hill, which is uh, um, kind of a really cool thing. Um, and I hope that that uh, um, you know I've been trying to talk to those folks, but um, yeah, I mean that's definitely an issue. I know that. We in, in print media, especially, I, I, I imagine in, in uh, television media, are, in, in are facing as well. But I know print and, and, and web media are definitely struggling with. I'll add this: um, you have here two historically black colleges mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that I believe both have journalism. Mm -hmm. You also have the Tribe Association of Black Journalists mm -hmm. that's here at the Center. Uh, you mentioned conferences. National Association of Black Journalists, there's a National Association of Hispanic Journalists, believe there's a National Association of Native American Journalists, all of which, and Native American Journalists, that all have conferences every day. Yeah. So those are also avenues that you can look at when you're looking to hire American journalists. Just that Twitter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Twitter is Tamara, uh, thank you for bringing that to uh, our attention, and, and I, I'm sorry. I, um, I mean, I, honest, I have in the past um, I've been asked to participate in a program and thought there's a person of color who knows more about this who should do it. It didn't really cross my mind this time, but I will ask myself that question um, in the future about what the diversity of the panel is and if there's a person who is better uh, 
qualified to have the seat within myself. And I take nothing from your experience in your work and your experience in town. I take nothing from that. No, no, no. But when we talk about expanding and we're talking about bearing witness and we're bearing witness to things, but the, the mm -hmm. situation with immigration hasn't even brought, been brought up in this room. And so when we're talking about bearing witness to some of these things that are happening politically, the people who are impacted need to have a voice in these conversations. Anybody have a, some solutions beyond the ones that Tamara has presented to us and the idea that Jordan had? I can say one thing about the immigration. We've tried to limit the discussion to, let's say, issues that impact us locally. And while that's a major issue, we thought when we put the panel together that the issues that we mentioned might take precedence over those. But then when you think about things like the, the deaths in the apartments at uh, 3100 Summit Avenue, spring before last, I think, when uh, five children who who, whose relatives had come from the Republic of the Congo, Democratic Republic of the Congo, died as a result of a, what is now called a, a, a pot on the stove. Mm -hmm. But uh, everyone was suffering from the conditions in that, in that project. That's, that's actually a subject I had here. Um, I was feeling that time didn't permit it. Yes, sir. At this point, out. And I can think of, there's one particular reporter that I know, uh, Tina Vasquez, who is, works, uh, used to work at Rewire, uh, lives in this community, uh, lives in West Salt, and is one of the foremost experts in the community. Okay. Tina Vasquez. Other comments or questions? Yes, sir. So I'll, I'll throw this out. Um, this is, this is uh, about the Summit Cone uh, fire. Mm -hmm. And yes. in some sense, the way that story was framed. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd you know, like maybe you guys to kind of help me understand this. Um, primarily, it's, it, it has. Uh, evolved as a uh, refugee story. Mm -hmm. This is a refugee story with a heavy emphasis on the, you mentioned the Congolese family, and, and, and probably people don't know that there actually were other um, groups there as well, including an African American family. Um, but it's, it was framed as a, primarily as a refugee issue. But, I mean, in some of the conversations today, and some of the stories that I've been talking about, there's also a huge housing issue. Yes, yes. It's also, as I think we've heard, a poor person, people of color issue. Yes. Uh, and I could go on and on with a whole bunch of stuff that, that we all who are on the ground seeing that stuff uh, on a regular basis could talk about. But I just want to ask, you know, you guys up in the panel, like, how do you frame these stories? I know it's not as simple as, well, that's a poor person's story, so we'll put it in the poor person uh, category. That's um, a gentrification story, therefore goes in the gentrification basket. I mean, how, how do you guys evolve that? It was, uh, you know, confession. It was, com it was frustrating for me to see it being portrayed consistently as a refugee issue. And to some extent, you know, beyond your control, I believe it was that kind of story was being driven by, you know, particular folks who had an interest in making it or minimizing it to a to a refugee story as opposed to, you know, a whole bunch of other things. Yeah. And I think that, you know, David Ford out of at WFG yes. you know, brought up some of these issues and so on. Um, but it seemed to be very, what's the word? Um, it, it, yeah. Narrow. It, it, it became narrow. I saw that as uh, a 
us one more story in our coverage. Um, yeah. I mean, marginalized people are marginalized. Well, it's not really looking at that. So, uh, no, that sounds right to me. Um, well, I. I think that um, the challenge that I think about is like a lot of uh, readers' interests are very siloed. Um, you know, Slumlords in Greensboro, that's, that's like a viral news story. Yeah. People are outraged about Slumlords. Um, but you know, there are people that are interested in food security, police accountability, um, and there is some framing that goes into it that you kind of anticipate that's going to grab people's attention, but um, we also need to bust down those paradigms and find ways to cross-pollinate interests, and I'm constantly frustrated by that. Um, so that's unsatisfying as it is, that's all I really have. I can say you referenced David's work, um, it turned into a series called Unsafe Haven, and um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, as far as editorial meetings, we definitely don't, you know, put things in different buckets in terms of what story is, does this fit? Um, you know, I, I'd say the time when the labels come is when we're doing the web piece and you, you have this thing where it's, you know, attach all tags that apply to your story. Um, so I'd say that, you know, we are about putting the context around the facts. Um, I think that's really interesting feedback, and I'm happy to take that back to my team and um, and share that. So yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Do you have any advice for teaching young journalism students and new journalists about investigative reporting and also balancing safety concerns? Because I'm hearing y'all been doing it for a while. And you're interviewing white nationalists, so you know, how can how can uh, so, I mean, most of I don't I don't want to I don't know about everyone else. Most of my investigative reporting stuff that I've done has been incredibly boring. It's involved like having a room full of documents and boring myself to death reading them, um, and then calling people. And that's that's um, I've I've rarely been the like chasing the 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 clan guy around you know yelling at him to talk to me. Did that? It wasn't a clan guy. It was a real estate developer. I did that once. But um, and I think the most dangerous thing I ever did was like jump a fence to count uh, uh, endangered gopher tortoises at a, at a development. But um, that was weird. Um, so you know, I, I think it, the, the the key to investigative journalism to me is just um, you know to not silo it as a different thing than journalism. Like everything is just asking questions and to always be curious and to and to be like. All right. So what? You know, like the the one of the the a story like a, a a big like an investigative story I did like maybe ten years ago started because I was going to write a column about this thing where I saw this uh, and it was on it was on like TV news so this this cop had like um, pushed a woman down the stairs or something that was caught on surveillance video. I was going to write this this column about. It. I was writing a column at the time. And I was like, you know, going to write this thing. It was like, and I got the police report and I started looking through it and I was like. That's weird. So, and, and there were some things that were like beyond like just doing hot take outrage kind of thing. So, I went in and started requesting documents, found, got some lawsuits, um, talked to some people, kept asking questions, found some more documents, you know, I'll go talk to this guy, go talk to this guy. And then one thing led to another. Um, this is in Florida, which has better public records laws than we do. Uh, found myself in a stack full of a room about the size full of documents that uh, came out a week later and found out that the city of Orlando had never disciplined a cop for excessive use of force. And um, and that was a story. It took me about three months to do. Um, and and I also and I ended up with like video of cops just beating the ever living hell out of people and then being cleared. Um, okay. So I mean I I think it's to to uh, the only the thing that I tell people when they want to do it is just keep asking questions keep ask keep looking for like what is the next thing that I don't have. That's good. One more question. Hey. Somebody yeah, a last question. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Don't 
PR. <laughs> I would say, um, so when the, show, the original show that I started in public radio, working on, when that ended, I, I was sort of upset because, it, you know, I didn't go where I eventually landed in the right place. Somehow, magically, I landed in the right gig, right out of the gate, and then that went away. And so I remember talking to a woman who was a filmmaker, and she said, I said, I'm now a general assignment reporter, and I don't know what that's going to look like. And she said, stay with it for two years. And I said, why two years? And she said, because you're going to find the stories you're passionate about, and you'll find the stories you want to tell. And um, she was right, and those stories surprised me because they ended up being the things that I know less about. Um, and you know, I think when I started, I wanted to constantly stay in the safe zone of interviewing people. Uh, for me, that was writers. I knew a lot about literature, and and the things now that interest me are healthcare and technology and agricultural science. And um, but I realized that those were the things where my curiosity. Um, very far outweighed, you know, any timidness I had about asking a dumb question. And, and I could ask any question because I didn't know anything. <laughs> and that's a reporter's job, is to ask all the questions, um, even the dumb ones. So I'd say just, um, you know, being a general assignment reporter is a great thing because you get, a, you know, great experience. So I, I know that was a little bit of my story, a little bit of advice, but um, I, to summarize all of that, um, take note of the stories that just seem um, to be, you know, where your, your curiosity leads you. And just, you know, write that down. Be like, mm -hmm. I'm still loving healthcare stories. Who knew? And, and keep following that. Um, it's a very uh, precarious and unstable industry, so I, I, I don't... <laughs> <laughs> Brian, give me it's some more money. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so uh, I, I want to encourage you. I think that journalism, journalism is like anything that somebody loves and is passionate about. If it's like you want to play the cello or you want to be a poet, um, you just do it and find a way. And you've got to take a lot of side gigs. Um, a lot of journalists wait tables. And you know, I, um, I still I have mode lawns to supplement my income as a journalist to cover the bills and I'm not proud to say it but I sometimes take um, what do you call it um, I take marketing work where I um, basically hire myself out to somebody who wants to market something and I am uh, conflicted out of writing legitimate journalism about that topic so um, but just do what you have to do to keep um, doing journalism and hopefully as you progress you get to do more real journalism and less of the side hustles that it takes to pay your bills. I would just add one thing, you know, don't be afraid to um, go and get a job in a city or town that nobody else your age wants mm -hmm. to go to. <laughs> and, and I would add versatility is, is absolutely paramount. Try as many different forms of writing as you can. Don't look down on any writing project. You can learn from doing any kind of writing. And while people often say that, different, that the genres are different, they're not that much different. The story is it, where, whatever you do. I'd like to thank you all very much. Uh, we're most appreciative for this wonderful crowd and for the panelists who attended tonight. Thanks so much. Cut everything off so there's no noise. <laughs>